Hello and welcome to Moments with the Master for this 31st day of January 2022. I am the Egg Friar, Father Josh from St. Martin's Celtic Catholic Church, joined by my brother on the phone. Who I think, oh, there he is. I think he stepped, I thought he stepped away to get his glasses. Anyway, I'm actually recording this on February 1st because uh, my wife is in the hospital and is. Um, you know, she's doing chemo, had a fever, has an infection, yada, yada, um, and also got COVID. So I was busy doing, um, important things. So anyway, uh, please pray for her. So the readings for the third, fourth, fourth Sunday after Epiphany are, uh, Jeremiah chapter one, verses four through five and 17 through 19, Psalm 71, one through six. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31 through 13, 13, and Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. As always, we encourage you to read all of these on your own and reflect on them. I am going to take a look at the epistle again this week. So let me read that, starting in chapter 12, verse 31, which is the end of chapter 12. But Paul didn't have chapters and verses, so this is just the continuation of his thought. Um, so just uh, to remember last week, he just finished talking about the body of Christ and how we have these different gifts and we all contribute to the body and one part is not more important than the other. And then he says, earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. You know what? Before I continue, let me back up. And then I'm going to read this again. What I want you to be thinking about as you hear me read this, because this passage that I'm about to read is very commonly read at weddings. I do this frequently at weddings. And it is a beautiful passage. What's that? Do you you remember Rusty's version of it? I do. It's a pocket bell's canon. My uncle, in fact, he sang it at my wedding. Um has a version of this. There's a million versions. One of my favorites of all time is the Petra version. Love knows when to let go. Love knows when to say no. I encourage you to find it. Um, Petra, that amazing Christian hair band from the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. But anyway... What's that? The first album? Uh, probably. I don't remember. It's like a southern rock type album, like like Leonard Skinner, but Petra, but Leonard Skinner instead of <laughs> Petra, except, you know, they, oh, anyway. Sorry. I have to hunt that down. So, um, but anyway, commonly read at weddings, but it's not about marriage. And I want you to eliminate that right now. Certainly things about it relate to marriage. And Paul, but Paul addresses marriage directly in Ephesians. This is not about marriage. He is talking about how we are to interact within the church. And just to remember, so the Corinthian church, it's fairly new. I mean, maybe a few years old. And it is mostly not Jewish. It is Lots. So there are there were churches, for instance, the church in Jerusalem, that were was heavily Jewish, and so they come in with an understanding of the Torah and an understanding of who God is. Um, they had been attending synagogues for a while, and so they understood had like some understanding of how these interactions took place. In the Corinthian church. The majority of these people are coming from a completely pagan culture. They are um, pagans and idol worshipers, uh, worshipers of the Greek and Roman gods that are coming into the Christian faith, but have no foundational understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. Um, They don't know anything about the history of Israel. They have probably, many of them have never read the Torah or the Tanakh, and so they don't know anything. And now they are trying to interact as the body of Christ. Um, They don't even understand that particular um, concept. They don't know anything. 
And so Paul is writing all of this in Corinthians to try to explain to them, look, let me, let me give you some, some stuff that you need to know. Okay, so what I'm about to read does not refer to marriage, but refers to the interaction inside the body of Christ. And let me back up one more time. And I don't remember if I said this last week, that the body of Christ, like we used, I think I did, but I'm going to say it again, does not refer to, like often we will, uh, people will use the phrase, in fact, I have over the years, I'm probably going to quit because it's confusing, um, that will say, I go to, or I am a part of this local body of believers. But there is no body of believers locally. Your 50 or 100 or even 10,000 is does not represent the body of Christ. It is a portion of the body. And remember, the body of Christ doesn't just include the living followers of Jesus on the planet right now, but all the followers of Christ throughout all the generations going all the way back to Adam and Eve. So even even the largest megachurch in the world is like a tiny, tiny little clump of cells within the whole body. So when Paul talks about, you know, in the body of Christ, we have these different gifts. He's not talking about your local church. He's talking about the entire body of Christ throughout all the ages. And here, he's not talking about your local church. He's talking about the body of Christ. So Let me show you a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So he's making a clear reference here to the pagan practices because that's the kind of stuff they would do in a pagan church. They would just make noise in order to try to get the attention of the gods. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains... But have not love, I am nothing. And nothing means nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver my body to be burned, if I am like sacrificing myself as a martyr, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not excuse me, irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. And as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. The perfect meaning when we get to heaven, we're not going to need prophecy because we'll know things. We don't need special knowledge because we'll know everything we need to know. We won't speak in tongues because we won't need that anymore. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, it's kind of interesting because we won't even, in, in heaven, Neither faith nor hope will be necessary. Either. No, I won't need. And our faith will be replaced by knowledge. Right, because I don't need faith in something that I can see right in front of me. But love, love, love lasts forever. forever. And so here's the thing: um, I could preach an entire sermon on just this one passage. It it, it is. There is a lot of depth into what Paul is saying here as you, if you break down the different words and the words he uses in Greek, yada, yada, yada. It's all great stuff. And I encourage you to go study that. But that's not what I want you to think about right now. Here's what I want you to think about. Because he's not talking about marriage. He's talking about the body of Christ, the church. Are we, as the people of God, 
Because remember, and I say this, this is like, I feel like I preach and I say the same things over and over, but it's because it needs to be said, and it shouldn't have to be said, but it needs to be said. When Jesus, in his last, some of his last words before he died, he says to his disciples, your blank will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Did he say your great church buildings? No. Did he say your amazing theology? No. Did he say um, your incredible programs that you have in your church, your children's ministry, and your... No. What did he say? Your love, not even for the people outside the faith, your love for your brothers and sisters, your love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The one proof that we have to show the world is our love for one another. What is that love supposed to look like? Patient, kind, not jealous, not boastful, not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It isn't irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrong, but rejoices in the right. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Is this how the people in the world look at the church and see us globally? And the answer to that is... Oh, no. No, not in total. There are probably pockets of followers of Christ that are viewed this way. But generally, no. What were you going to say? I was thinking about the, the love one for another. First of all, I'm, I'm going to disagree with a small part of what you said, which is... No, nope, you can't do that. I'm always right. I'm older <laughs> and I'm priestlier. Oh. Uh, <laughs> this is about marriage. But the issue is that we understand marriage incorrectly. We think that, first of all, the great lie is that marriage is about me and my fulfillment. The second great lie is that marriage is about me and my spouse and our marriage together. And it's not. It's it's about creating a family, and it's about the marriage in the context of the rest of the church. Also, so much marriage terminology is used that I, I think that um, it, it's both about marriage and about the church because it's because there's so much of that going on. Well, okay, so that. let me, I'll come back to you. So I will say okay. this, because marriage is um, the way that God expresses the relationship between himself and Israel and himself and the church. We are the bride of Christ. We are, and, and Israel over and over is talked about as a uh, the bride of Yahweh. So there is that. Huh? From Hosea. Yes. Well, in multiple, multiple places. But go ahead. What was your other thing? Uh, a couple of things, because I, you're coming to a big ending, and I, I want to throw this in there. Um, secondly, I was thinking about our family. And, and do you remember how many people... Um, friends that we would bring over, sometimes boyfriends and girlfriends, just they, more than they wanted to be connected with the boy or girl, they wanted to be part of our family. Oh, yeah. Um, there were a lot of people. There were girls that I dated that I quit dating but still maintained a relationship with my mother. Um, it wasn't because they wanted to, like a daddy had created this holy thing, or it wasn't because of the way that we lived, or the ministry that we ran. It was um, more than anything else that mommy and daddy did. They they loved us, and we loved each other. It, it is, throwing a little uh, stuff this way, it's, it's one of the things that frustrates me now, because the core of what our family is, uh, is tried and 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 um, I wish that the love could override the rest of it because that that was what we were. Um, I don't know if it's what we are, but it was what we were, and it's what drew people in. Hmm. Uh, the last thing, which is probably less important, <clears throat> I hadn't thought about this in the context of what you were saying before, but. Um, bringing in people from outside of the Jewish faith and like God had spent a long time teaching the Jews about not, not monotheism, although yes, uh, but not just that, but about love and devotion and covenants and promises and, and, and a love that is not dependent on anything that I do or don't do. Like I can, I can ruin myself. Yeah. 
but I'm not going to piss him off enough to ruin me, except where he's trying to chastise me and bring me back. Um, so the, the, me. the contractual nature of every <coughs> pagan religion, excuse me, you, um, of every pagan religion where you give something to the God and the God, maybe if they're in a good mood, gives you something in return. Yes. Or the sacrifice, the sacrificing children. Day, not just sacrifice, sacrifice in order to gain. Um, every goddess of love and is not a goddess of love. It's a goddess of, she's a goddess of lust. And even the hearth goddesses were jealous, horrid bitches uh, uh, who, who uh, uh, did horrible things to people when, when, you know, they, when they got up, when they're, cheating god husbands got uh, uh but they always were punishing the people right so to teach this this is a huge shift cultural shift in how you understand gods god that's so interesting the idea that i'm so sorry to be taking this over but the idea that maybe the tongues that they were speaking in the previous chapter were their versions of clanging symbols to get the attention of God. Huh, that um, is interesting. Anyway, that, that was what I had to say. Go ahead. Well, so, um, well, I shouldn't have messed with it. Hang on. All right. So the, um, where was I? Yes. So if we are not seen this way, and I think I would say generally, I mean, I just heard on the radio this morning about um, uh, something, some new development in the Spanish Roman Catholic Church with uh, abuse victims and stuff like that. Huh. If we are not seen this way, then what do we do about it? Um, because it's one thing to just point and another thing to actually, I mean, we've, it, how do you change it? Um, and and I the way we change it is individually. Um, and it, although we are speaking globally and generationally, um, the way you change it is personally and locally. Um, and so revival happens starting with me. And so I think the call to us, the challenge is for me to look at these things and then look at how I view in my interactions on social media. Do I um, demonstrate these aspects of love? When I see my Christian brothers and sisters suffering around the world, when I, you know, we've said this before, but when I see my Christian brothers and sisters on the south, southwest border or trying to come into our country, this country, United States, um, looking for help. Um, how do I respond? Um, how do I respond to people I may not agree with completely who are of the Christian faith, but have some different ideas on um, what I would call second and third tier theological issues? Um, and that's because if we cannot do this, then what we are proving to the world is we are not his disciples. And may that not be ever said of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.